Hello and welcome. This is Drew Vision IT Consulting. It is September 2023 and we're enjoying some nice cool weather. It's actually overcast and it's a fresh relief compared to the 100 degree day. So we've had a whole hell of a lot of, quite literally, felt like hell. So uh, I wanted to introduce a new series, IT Seller Series. This is consultative selling superiority. And it's a little bit of my flavor and panache at approach to sales that has helped me to be successful. So I thought about how do I capture some attention, some views, maybe it's clickbait, maybe it's not, but in truth, I've sold over two and a half billion dollars. So how did they do it? How did they get here? Well, it wasn't easy and it certainly wasn't a one man band. So what I wanted to do with this particular episode is talk through the journey. How did we get here? Is it going to be five minutes slash 10 minutes? Not really. Uh, no, it'll probably go longer. I love storytelling, right? And obviously storytelling can be a part of sales. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to share some of this journey that I've been on and maybe you resonate with it. Maybe there'll be some things that ring true to you. Maybe there's some things I could have done better. I guarantee it. I absolutely guarantee there's things I could have done better, but I wanted to share a little bit. So if there's any way that I can help you personally on your IT sales journey, let me know. I'm here to help uh, the audience in whatever way that I can. So stay tuned. <laughs> Let's dive right into it. Hey, so here we go. Our IT seller series. This is the very first one. Hopefully it's a good one. Let's find out. Be sure to let me know in the comments down below. So how did I sell two and a half billion dollars? And as I just said in the previous clip, it was a long journey, man. Like it wasn't easy. I've had more managers than I've had jobs. Um, there were times I got yelled at. I've even been threatened with unemployment. Close this deal or you're out. One of the joys of the previous company that I worked for is you would encounter that surprisingly often. But that said, I made it through. I've had a very, very successful, well-earning career in IT sales. So it's been both transactional as well as relationship-based. And it, it's been a lot of fun, honestly, just to learn. So I wanted to give you a little bit about what did it look like? So I started August 21st in 2000 in Smyrna, Georgia. I actually got the job uh, through my parents' church. My parents went to church uh, with this gentleman named John. I won't say any last names in this video just to protect the innocent. And uh, he was a senior executive with my previous employer. And um, yeah, he just put my resume in there and, and I got hired, right? I was mowing lawns before I joined this company, right? Previous to that, um, my old roommate and I had a business doing web design, uh, did a couple cool IT projects. So I had a little bit of experience. Um, but not a lot, right? I had just graduated from Kennesaw State University with a history degree. What else do you do with history, right? Uh, you teach, uh, collect unemployment, uh, or you go into sales of some kind, and that's precisely what I did. And honestly, it was a lot better than mowing lawns at the time. Um, but it, it ended up being just such a blessing in my life to, to go into the IT profession. Right? Mostly because I just got to learn, right? Um, my previous wife, um, she used to talk about having a quarter jar. And every time that I would talk about this company in a public setting, and I was so proud, right? They were in the top five brands in the entire world at the time. They no longer are. Uh, we could have a whole separate episode about what they did to themselves to lead to where they are today but they're still a major market player, right? Uh, I certainly will always be grateful for everything that I learned there, the mentors, the friends, and the compatriots. But I was so proud, 
And I mean, I would have dollars and dollars and dollars a quarter at a time talking about this company in public. But mostly what it was was I just learned, right? So August 21st, 2000, I get hired into IBM. We have three months of training. We go to this thing called Project 13. There were 13 sellers. And our job was to take overflow calls from 1-800 IBM, whatever it was. Uh, never called it. Don't know. Didn't even write it down. Could I tell people what the number was then? No. Could I tell it now? No. Absolutely not. But basically, people would call to buy generally laptops. Kids going to college, needs a laptop. Cool. All right. Um, and basically, you, you sit on a queue, wear your little headset, and you wait for the phone to ring. And so our goal was for each person on this project to sell $100,000 over the phone. And I was one of three people to do that with, what was it, 113K of sales. I didn't, I didn't like crush it. I didn't blow it out. Um, but I beat it, right? For a first time big boy job. Yay. <laughs> I actually, you know, I exceeded my targets, right? And when the project was over and actually, oh, reminds me, my very first ThinkPad model that I sold was an A20P. That was the three spindle, basically had a floppy drive, a CD-ROM drive, um, and of course the hard drive. That's each thing spinning is a spindle. Uh, it was the largest model that we had at the time. This is a 15 inch uh, performance laptop and it was Henry uh, Silverman from New York and the model number was 2629HTU. That meant it had the upgraded um, Pentium 3 processor. Uh, I want to say it was uh, 900 megahertz at the time. We didn't even hit gigahertz, right? We were talking 900 megahertz, um, eight gigs of RAM or was it four? Eight or or and a 20 gig hard drive. I mean, this was cutting edge stuff in 2000, right? Today, your phone could annihilate this laptop. But this this was awesome. This guy is from New York. He wanted the biggest, the baddest, the best. We had a long conversation, a couple of phone calls. And um, of course, through this company, um, we had significant delivery delays. And so he was upset, but he did wait for it. And so right around, if I recall, he got his laptop around February of 2021. So I went from that team to LED that was large enterprise direct. And this was IBM's attempt to, ah, shoot, I just said it, uh, to replicate what Dell was doing at the time, right? Direct sales model. And previously, it was always an indirect sales model, right? You're selling through resellers, et cetera. This was our attempt to just sell mass quantities of things to our clients. And uh, it was okay. It went all right. Um, I came into this account. One of uh, the customers was a large grocery store chain uh, based in Southern North Carolina. That's probably a clue. Uh, and they already had this rollout of, of desktops and um, uh, servers. And these servers were intended for educational purposes. Like they could do training courses on, on these servers. And so it was already in flight and I was there to manage any supply issues to, it was really a customer service role. It wasn't quite a sales role, uh, but I treated it like a sales role. And so at the time, this particular customer used HP as their corporate standard. And if I recall, I had roughly 6,500 corporate employees, give or take. Um, and so we beat HP and we won that business, right? It was a whole, her name was Kimberly. I still remember her name. I signed up for Amway, right? Just to get in better uh, with her, get more of her ear. I'm not saying that's why she switched. She got a sweet deal. We showed why our products were better. Um, but it was also relationship gives you the right to have that conversation. And so that's what I did. And I learned a lot from Kimberly and her husband, Mike. Um, I was zero dollars of sales for Amway um, is what it is. So we did very successfully with them. Uh, we had a couple other customers. I had an insurance customer out of Delaware. Um, and that really what I spent my time doing. So I did well enough with that. And because I was able to grow the account, um, they decided that, well, let's put, put them in a hundred roll. So the latter half of 2001, now bear in mind, this is a new world, right? This is after 9-11. Um, 
this was just crazy times. So I move into this role and I remember being in downtown Atlanta with the outside sales rep, Paul, and uh, we were selling to a property management company. We're actually in a high rise in downtown Atlanta. We had to get evacuated, went back to the sales center in Smyrna and watched Peter Jennings all day as we watched the uh, events of 9-11 unfold. It, it was a mind blowing day. Um, but actually did very, very well uh, in that particular group. And then my company decided to repurpose our group and turn us into something that they had outsourced to a different company called Direct Alliance Corporation based in Phoenix, Arizona, Tempe, to be precise. And DAC, uh, we were intended to be like them, but it was a political nightmare it fell apart at the middle management executive levels and so um, i did make my targets in that particular job but we only did it for one quarter and then they said you know what it's not worth it so they let us apply to new jobs and so began my career in outside sales right so i sold to the u.s army disa defas DARPA, that was a lot of fun, um, and the VA. I had the FDA for a little while. I had a couple other customers kind of come and go as our territories changed. And this was, I mean, I traveled 200 days a year, right? So I moved uh, from Smyrna, Georgia, all the way up to uh, Fairfax, Virginia, right? So I'd be in the heart of federal land. And my job was to sell to these, these customers. And what is not included in the number you see on the screen is I'll call it the GWACs, right? So government-wide acquisition contracts where like, oh, we bid on ITES, billion dollar contract. Yeah, our customer or our company, we didn't make, I don't think we came anywhere close to making a billion dollars on that, right? So when I put totals below it is literally only what myself or my salespeople touched, put their hands on and we sold, right? Whether it was in um, Siebel, our CRM at the time, um, or much later in life, uh, we've had so many different tools. Now I think they're on Salesforce, but point being, I, I don't count those, right? If I was to say, oh, I get credit for selling, I helping sell ITES, uh, then the number would be in the billions of billions, right? So this is what I personally have actually touched. And this was a lot of fun. I mean, I remember I had some, some of my favorite customers, um, uh, Bradley Bragg, Oh, shoot, I wasn't doing last names. <laughs> First, there, Gav, uh, may you rest in peace. He perished in the Second Gulf War. Um, let's see. Uh, Sergeant Major uh, Jordan, Michael Jordan's brother, he was at uh, Fort Bragg. Um, not to be confused with Bradley, who was actually at Fort Hood. Um, and not that uh, Command Sergeant Major bought anything, but he used to bring his his cadets through our trade shows, right? We got tables set up, got all of our wares, our pamphlets and brochures, trying to market, you know, our products, right? Our desktops, laptops, et cetera. And he would bring his guys through. Uh, he is not nearly as tall as his brother. And I mean, this, this guy was just such a beefcake, very quiet. Um, that was very fun and interesting. Um, Eddie was a C chief warrant officer at level three uh, for Army JAG. Uh, that was a great, great win. Probably one of my most memorable sales presentations today. And for a lot of fun, right? Because we were tackling exactly what his heartburn was with his previous supplier, right? And we showed how our product would tackle that. And we followed up and kept the relationship alive for a number of years to make sure that you've got no heartburn because you made this choice because that's a hard choice to pick something sometimes. So a lot of great stories, a lot of great business partners and direct sales in that particular job, the largest deal there. Uh, let's see, that was 36 million for E Army University. It was a program to allow enlisted soldiers to get a college degree online. Um, probably my most fun uh, large sale. And of course, I did this job for roughly two years or so. And if you don't know this about me, I'm actually uh, blind. And so I have something called Usher syndrome and it's tunnel vision and night blindness. And at the time, the travel, I mean, all the miles I was driving in my car, it, it was just untenable. 
And so I had to give up my dream job. I loved this particular job. It's my favorite job that I had ever had in my life to this point. Now, granted, the basis compared mowing lawns, but sure, I think you get the picture. And so I loved this job and it was heartbreaking. And I just had just a piss poor attitude to have to leave Virginia, where I lived, and move back to Atlanta to, to basically take the job that I had before I went to outside sales. But eventually, thanks to some great mentors like Steve, there's an article about him on my LinkedIn, um, I, I got back into the right headspace. And so um, I was able to sell a lot of large deals um, as an inside rep selling to the federal government. Uh, I remember one of them, uh, the Department of State, right? And so at this point in time, a lot of our products were made in Mexico. And don't ask me how we had ants in the desktops that we sold. 12,000, an order for 12,000 desktops stopped at the border because we have ants in the desktops. Like, oh my God. Um, you know, we had other very, very large deals. We sold a lot of laptops to the U.S. Air Force. Um, I enjoyed just the art of the deal, right? How do we figure out the economics of this deal? How do we make it profitable? You have loss leaders, right? You're going to sell your laptop at base materials costs or sometimes minus, but you're going to make it up with keyboards, mice, targets, bags, et cetera. And figuring out how to beat your competition when usually they're cheaper, right? How to sell that value and be different was really a lot to learn. And so I thoroughly enjoyed all of that. Uh, and of course, um, I we sold off our PC division to a Chinese company roughly two, six-ish. And so I stayed there for a year. And then the day that we were allowed to leave, I did. And so I, I rejoined my prior company as a client rep. Now, a client rep was a generalist, right? They weren't a specialist. All of those previous jobs, I was a specialist specializing in selling desktops, laptops, uh, high-end workstations, and the x86 brand of servers, right? So 1U, 2U, 4U, et cetera. Right? I knew all about all of these products to a great, great level of detail. Um, you know, I remember when Xeon processors were invented Right. I remember that I was there and I sold a lot of them. Right. Anybody who wanted to scale out, run Windows or Linux, it was the way to go. Um, it was kind of a, a redheaded stepchild for my previous company because they had the big iron stuff, whether it was mainframes, uh, your Unix servers. Uh, yeah. But hey, they had a use and now they're, they're the predominant, preeminent servers on the planet. So anyway, um, so I, I was a client rep, a generalist. Now I could sell all of the hardware products, whether it was the lower end stuff or the high end stuff, and I could sell software or services. And so uh, my, cust my territory at the time, and actually I'm in a documentary, you can find it on my personal YouTube channel. I was in a documentary called America's Strength. We actually got a customer to talk about disabled people in the workplace. And so uh, this particular customer was in um, South Manhattan, and uh, they were an affiliate marketing company. Right? So my industry was the computer services industry. I had a lot of cust customers in this space. And so I would go from Atlanta to New York, spend a couple weeks and just, you know, you're doing bam, 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 hit, hitting the pavement, four, five, seven customers a day. Then you take them out for drinks and dinner afterwards. It was a blast, right? New York City in the 2000s was phenomenal. It was so much fun. Um, just an amazing place full of electric energy and a bunch of just very beautiful, nice and accommodating people, right? For being a blind guy in New York City, um, one of the best places to work. So I did that very quite well, uh, became a team lead for that team, uh, and then later a first line manager, right? And so um, you'll see that the biggest number of sales was actually as a first line manager. And as noted, I managed 13 salespeople, inside sellers, and our territory was the Southeast. So we could sell anything IBM sells through any channel, any route to market that IBM sells. So direct business partners, distributors, et cetera. And the majority of it at the time was, you know, I series, P series, kind of your bigger iron stuff. 
um, some services, but generally maintenance and warranties was a lot of that. And then, of course, a lot of software, right? If anybody remembers Lotus Notes, we had a lot of entitlements for Lotus Notes. And really what our jobs were to do was just to make those calls, touch those clients again and again and again, to touch those business partners, to keep the strength of the brand front and center alive, and to talk about whatever our promotional uh, products and services were at the time. And our team, it did well. And then, of course, 2009, the world just fell over dead. So I actually, um, I laid off my team and got laid off all on the same day. A few people kept their jobs, but most of the people had to exit the business. So it was a sad day, but thus is life at a major corporation in the IT world. Uh, and I think we see right now, times are not much different than then. So the next chapter would be infrastructure services, right? And so uh, I got back into my previous employer in this job as, I think they called it a progression rep, but really what it was, was it was a program management role. And our job was to look at the pipeline of services, IT services in the infrastructure space and figure out what route to market was most suitable for our clients to consume from, right? And typically your smaller deals, your more profitable deals uh, tended to be best done by inside sales. And so when you had the outside sales channel or the business partner channel, sales channel, holding on to these deals that really just weren't an ideal fit, it was my job to figure, no, identify them, talk to them, figure out, you know, are they valid? All right, are they qualified? And what is the best channel to close the deal, right? Meaning highest odds to close it um, at the least cost to the company. And that's really what I spent roughly four years doing. And I love that job. It was a lot of fun. I, I spent a lot of time with Hyperion uh, Analytics. Um, we used Hyperion S-Base at the time. And I would comb through tens of thousands of records, right, of our pipeline data. Right. What sales stages are they? What's the revenue? Right. What type of contact detail is there? Right. Are, is this stuff real? Um, so I spent an awful lot of time doing that. And then, uh, during that time, we also piloted uh, and rolled out a brand made it from scratch. I worked with a, a Domino developer, Eddie, uh, still talk to Eddie once in a while. Great guy. Uh, and we developed this application to take this pipeline data and figure out that coupled with our um, our backlog data, figure out when are contracts ending, um, when do they need to renew, um, and how do we call it, right? If you have unused backlog, you need to get the customer to spend that money or else you're going to have a revenue reversal, you can't recognize it, etc. So we created an application specified by territory per seller to see what are all the active contracts in your territory, which ones are ending when, and how do you actually figure out which ones to call first to increase your odds of renewing them, AKA sales. And so um, that was called the Services Territory Management Matrix or STM2 as we affectionately called it. So that was a very, very cool project. And then uh, that particular position got defunded. So I moved to a different role as a territory services leader. And that was really just your, your transactional uh, infrastructure project services sales and my territory was New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Uh, that's where I actually met a guy. Uh, is, it, is that when I met Ted? No, I met Ted in the next role. Hey, I'll talk about Ted in a second. But yeah, that was just, it was fun, right? You talked to a lot of clients. We had huge ones. It didn't really matter. I mean, we had lottery companies. We had the most expensive insurance company on the planet, like in terms of personal insurance, um, all, all kinds of business that we did in that role. But I was only in it for a year and then I was able to get a job. Uh, so at this point I remarried and my new wife is from Texas. She really wanted to go to Texas. And I had heard that there was this new group starting up um, in Texas, Dallas, Texas, or Capel specifically uh, for project executives. So I applied for it, got the job, and moved to um, Coppell, Texas, which is where I remain to this very day. And so from 2015 to 2020, I was in this role managing large outsourcing clients uh, in a variety of work streams, right? Um, initially, this group, the reason it was different than um, 
the groups like it that existed previously was our job was to take slow growth, no growth, hate our company clients and turn them around. Um, whether or not it was to recover profit, uh, to lose less money or to renew them, or it was basically a lower center of gravity, closer to the client, uh, trying to improve the health and wellness of these particular, uh, client relationships. And I love that job. Uh, it was my favorite. And we're going to do a subsequent episode all about how do you take a client from, in this case, a Medallia score of three and get them to a 10, right? Because when you do that, you can take their spend from 8 million a year to 80. How do we do that? How does that work? That'll be a subsequent episode. I, I don't want to uh, fully open the kimono just, just yet, but that was a great success story. And it starts with humility and listening. So that was a lot of fun. And then, of course, this is already waxing poetic or way too long, as per usual. So the last chapter. And obviously, that was consulting. And in terms of just being a person who loves curiosity, um, a hallmark of my two and a half billion dollars of sales, I taught it to my salespeople, but I have embraced it truly and utterly for myself as asking questions. This job was literally my dream come true job. And so I went into a role, uh, CSE, Complex Solution Executive, and your job is to win big deals. And as it turned out, my very first big deal to work on was my client in my previous role. Uh, happy to say, so we responded to an RFI, which led to an RFQ. Uh, and the RFQ was to write an RFP. We actually won the RFQ, so I wrote the RFP, which we subsequently won and for $280 million, and we sold another $80 million after that. Um, there's so many stories and so many people and so many great and amazing teams along the way. Um, I've had immensely talented peers, coworkers, and mentors in particular. And we will do yet another different episode on how do you pick your mentor, right? You pick people who have the qualities and virtues and traits that you don't. Uh, I've been a mentor and I've spent a lot of time being a mentee. But if you see all the numbers, you add them all up, that's roughly the $2.5 billion that you see in the thumbnail. So with that said, please click like and subscribe, add a comment below, ask any questions that you'd like to ask. I'm always here to help. I'm also here to learn. So if you have some tips of the trade, something that you feel would help others, share it down below. We'd love to hear from you. Till next time, this is Drew Vision IT Consulting. Thanks for watching.